Whoa, wrong intro there, but not far off from the story that we will hear today. Hello, and welcome to the Bible Paladin, where we explore the sacred scriptures as seen through history to the modern day. In our last episode, we heard how Laban had tricked Jacob into marrying both his daughters and working for twice the amount of time that he had promised. Now we'll hear about his domestic life and the sibling rivalry of his two wives as they contend for his attention. Remember how God had promised Abraham that his progeny would be like the stars of the sky. Well, this was not obvious in the limited number of sons and children that Abraham and his son Isaac had had. It will be a different story with Jacob as we now hear about all of his children. So let's begin with the ending of chapter 29 and hear about this family. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he made her fruitful, while Rachel remained barren. Leah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Reuben. For she said, it means the Lord saw my misery. Now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, it means the Lord heard that I was unloved and therefore he has given me this one also. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son, and she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me, since I have now borne him three sons. That is why she named him Levi. Once more she conceived and bore a son, and she said, This time I will give grateful praise to the Lord. Therefore she named him Judah. Then she stopped bearing children. We begin this narrative by hearing about the four sons that Leah bears Jacob. And we are told that God allowed her to conceive because she was unloved by Jacob. Now, many Bibles translate this as hated because of the Hebrew word sane. Although hate is such a strong word in English, some Bibles translate it as unloved. If we look at the ancient Hebrew pictograph for the letters in this word, it is that of a thorn and a seed. The interpretation is that the thorn causes one to turn away or avoid the plant. So we can say that Leah represented what Jacob wanted to turn away from, and this can be understood for many reasons. She was not the object of his love, nor his first choice. He did not find her as beautiful as Rachel, and he was forced to marry her because he was deceived. Of course, we have seen that God has a special place in his heart for those who are despised, hated, or neglected. He tends to care for them just as he did for Hagar. For this reason, he opens her womb and she gives birth to Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. This shows that Jacob's sons were not merely the work of nature, but that of God's grace. And each of their names are significant and give us a glimpse of Leah's growth as well. At first, she is surprised, and we actually have three meanings for Reuben's name. Literally, it means, look, a son. But the symbolic meanings given, based on similar sounding words, are he saw my misery, and he will love me. This shows that she is primarily concerned with Jacob's affection. Both Simeon and Levi's names also follow this formula. For one means he heard, and the other he will become attached, both referring to her misery over her relationship with Jacob, God's response, and her desire to be loved by her husband. With Judah, the pattern has changed, as his name is interpreted to mean, I will give thanks and praise. This is the proper response for God's gift of grace. And Judah will be great among his brothers and a significant ancestor in salvation history. And we will hear more about each of these sons as they grow and we see their prominence in the history of Israel. But let us go back to the text and continue as we hear about Rachel's plight and the jealousy that she has with her sister. When Rachel saw that she failed to bear children to Jacob, she became envious of her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children or I shall die. In anger, Jacob retorted, Can I take the place of God who has denied you the fruit of the womb? She replied, Here is my maidservant Bilhah. Have intercourse with her and let her give birth on my knees so that I too may have offspring, at least through her. So she gave him her maidservant Bilhah as a consort and Jacob had intercourse with her. When Bilhah conceived and bore a son, Rachel said, God has vindicated me. Indeed, he has heeded my plea and given me a son. Therefore, she named him Dan. Rachel's maidservant Bilhah conceived again and bore a second son. And Rachel said, I engaged in a fateful struggle with my sister, and I prevailed. So she named him Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had ceased to bear children, she gave her maidservant Zilpah to Jacob as a consort. 
So Jacob had intercourse with Zilpah, and she conceived and bore a son. Leah then said, What good luck! So she named him Gad. Then Leah's maidservant Zilpah bore a second son to Jacob. And Leah said, What good fortune! Meaning, women call me fortunate. So she named him Asher. One day, during the wheat harvest, when Reuben was out in the field, he came upon some mandrakes, which he brought home to his mother Leah. Rachel asked Leah, Please let me have some of your son's mandrakes. Leah replied, Was it not enough for you to take away my husband? Do you must now take my son's mandrakes too? Very well then, Rachel answered. In exchange for your son's mandrakes, Jacob may lie with you tonight. That evening, when Jacob came home from the fields, Leah went out to meet him. You are now to come in with me, she told him, because I have paid for you with my son's mandrakes. So that night he slept with her, and God heard her prayer. She conceived and bore a fifth son to Jacob. Leah then said, God has given me my reward for having let my husband have my maidservant. So she named him Issachar. Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son to Jacob. And she said, God has brought me a precious gift. This time my husband will offer me presents, now that I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulun. Finally, she gave birth to a daughter, and she named her Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel. He heard her prayer and made her fruitful. She conceived and bore a son, and she said, God has removed my disgrace. So she named him Joseph, meaning, May the Lord add another son to this one for me. Although Rachel is the beloved of Jacob, she is not shown in a great light in these passages. First, we are told that she is envious of her sister, and she confronts Jacob about this. And to be envious of someone is to grieve at their fortune, where ideally someone should rejoice in another's fortune, especially as in this case, it benefits the entire family. But there was an Eastern saying that said to be childless is to be as good as dead. And this is what Rachel was referring to. And yet when she confronts Jacob, he is right to be upset for a couple of reasons. When she demands that Jacob give her children, it is an unjust accusation as he truly does love her more than Leah and desires what is best for her. But also, and more importantly, she is blaspheming God by such a statement. Jacob responds by saying that he cannot take the place of God, as she was inferring. It is also notable that unlike Rebekah, Jacob's mother, Rachel does not pray to the Lord regarding her situation. Instead, she gets upset and complains to her husband. In her anxiety, she decides to give her maidservant to him, as Sarah did with Hagar which, although acceptable during this time in their culture, it was done out of impatience and lack of trust in God. Also, typically this would only be done if there was no heir. So Rachel is doing this to compete with her sister. And the expression to give birth on my knees refers to an ancient Near East tradition in which the father will take the newborn onto his lap or on his knees and basically legally adopt the child as his own. And so Rachel is using this ritual to say that these are truly her children, and she would have the legal rights to them, and which is why she is able to name them as well. And of course, we are given the meanings of the children, just as we have with many of the names in the Bible. Dan is seen as one by whom she is vindicated, and Naphtali is explained by the struggle that she believes she has won over Leah. However, in reality, this is a struggle not with her sister, but with God. As Jacob tells her, only God has the power to give life. And so by this action, she is challenging God, by using a loophole according to their cultural laws. Of course, this does not sit well with Leah, who will not be outdone. And she gives Jacob her maidservant for a concubine, so that she too can claim additional children for him. Zilpah has also two sons. Because her plan worked, Leah names the first Gad, meaning what good luck, and Asher with a similar meaning, what good fortune, or that women will call me fortunate. Now, for those keeping track at home, this brings the total to eight children four from Leah, two from Bilhah, and two from Zilpah. But they're not finished yet, and this seems to continue the theme of strife that follows Jacob throughout his life. And so we come to this charming, if not profane, tale of the mandrakes, the selling of mandrakes for the right to sleep with Jacob. So I'm not sure if they had some sort of schedule, but Rachel was willing to try anything at this point. And mandrakes were considered a form of aphrodisiac that would promote the conception of children. And even the word in Hebrew is... Um, is made up of similar sounding words for breasts and pleasure. That's nasty. Of course, Rachel's plan backfires. And as we were reminded earlier, only God will determine when a woman will have a child. 
In the meantime, Leah has three more children, two sons and a daughter. Names are given again with meanings based on the circumstances for the boys. Issachar is named after the thought that God has rewarded Leah, and Zebulun is seen as a gift, which would encourage Jacob to appreciate her more and offer her gifts. The daughter's name is not explained, as the author seems to be more concerned with the sons. This also brings up the question of whether or not they had more daughters than just Dinah. The sons were the heirs who would carry the family line, and Dinah only seems to be mentioned because she features prominently in a later chapter. Daughters were not as often listed in ancient genealogies, so this does not rule out the possibility that other daughters were born between these four women. Finally, we are told that God remembered Rachel, and this may seem like a confusing phrase, but it is something that we have heard a few times before. The first time was when we were told that God remembered Noah. This does not mean that he had ever forgotten him, but acts as a signal in the text that God returns to the plan that he had originally started. This phrase usually takes place when the person seems lost or forgotten, or all hope is lost. We will see it many times with the prophets when they are told that God remembers his people, particularly in times of persecution or exile. Rachel, in this case, feels that she will never give a child to Jacob. But we, the readers, are reminded that God remembers her, and she does indeed bear a son. His name, like Leah's firstborn, has more than one meaning. She names him Joseph or Yosef. The first explanation of his name is that God has removed her disgrace. The second is, may the Lord add another son to this one for me. So Rachel still comes across as a bit needy, as she immediately requests that God give her another son after Joseph's birth. This does foretell, however, that she will indeed have another son, which we will learn about later. But this part of the story ends with a significant number of 12 children, 11 sons, and one daughter. Now we hear about the beginnings of this next generation that will take us all the way through the end of the book of Genesis. But before that, we're going to hear about a few more adventures of Jacob. But this current act that we saw really centers upon his wives and the struggles that they have as being part of his family. The simple meaning of these texts is that God is fulfilling the promise that he made to Abraham, and through these sons, a great nation will emerge. However, an important theological theme to take from these passages is the way in which God acts within the mundane and often messy nature of the human experience. The home life of Jacob, Leah, and Rachel was not a healthy one, yet God was able to intervene in such a way to fulfill his promises and set in motion an even greater divine plan. In this particular story, there are no great visions, no appearances of angels, no out-of-the-ordinary miracles. We have two women trying to come to terms with their place in the household of Jacob where they understand their primary role is to produce heirs and maintain a home for their growing tribe. Remember, Leah and Rachel were raised by Laban, who did not follow the God of Abraham. They were products of their culture and upbringing. Jacob himself was still unsure and growing in his own relationship with the Lord. We have here a story of struggle, which is the overriding theme of Jacob's life, beginning with him wrestling with his brother in his mother's womb. And yet, going back to the first story of creation, God brings something good out of chaos. God's creative work really did not stop on the sixth day. He continues to renew his people, oftentimes in spite of them. This is the deeper meaning behind Jacob's retort to Rachel when she demands that he give her children. He says that she is asking of him what only God can do. Even though God works through the natural process, life still depends on the grace of God. And this is a grace that looks out for those who suffer. And this is the other theme. God cares for those who cry out, for those who are in pain. Leah only conceives because she is unloved by her husband, not by any merit of her own. And for Rachel, it takes much longer for her to have children, and it too is by God's grace, not from her complaints, plots, or consumption of mandrake. And what about us today? How can we be inspired by this tale? For some, we might find consolation that perhaps our life isn't as bad as the soap opera that we see here. But even if it does compare... It may be comforting to believe that God has not forgotten us. The plan of God is still moving in the background of our lives. Every once in a while, we might see a glimpse of it. And like Leah, take a moment to praise God for the blessings when we become aware of them. We do not need to look for miracles or wait around for a sign. Believe me, I've been down that road. The God that we see in the Bible sometimes works in such a way with some people. But for the vast majority of us, God makes his presence known in the mundane actions and experiences of our everyday lives. 
God even uses our bad decisions to craft something beautiful down the road. Sometimes we live our days without ever noticing and find that we don't even know the path that we're on or which way to turn. But every once in a while, we might see the light of his presence peeking through. We might feel like Rachel and think that, oh, God does remember me. Or we can actively seek the Lord and open our eyes to the miracles that are around us in the everyday things. Ignatius of Loyola, a 6th century Spanish priest, spoke of being able to see God in all things. I think life could look a lot differently if we developed that trait. The ability to see God in all things, even in the messy, chaotic, difficult things. Thank you for watching, and I hope that you learned something, were inspired, or just enjoyed reflecting on the Bible together today. So please join me next time as Jacob the Trickster returns. Until then, seek out the presence of God and do good.